Thank you, and thanks for organizing this really valuable uh, symposium, AAA and Bond. Um, most of you, of course, will be familiar with Australia House. Uh, whether you've been to London and been in there, or you just know about it. But how many of you, I wonder, know about the other Australia House? It's an architect designed, very beautiful, rather modest, um, wooden building in Echigo Tsumari province uh, in Japan. And it's been there for a number of years now. It grew out of a wooden shack, which Australians used as a, um, an artist's sort of residence. And then someone thought it would be a good idea to get a, a distinguished architect, Andrew Burns, to design a better looking place that could be a multi-use space for performance, for uh, exhibitions, and for a residence for the artists. It was built in time for the 2012 Triennale at Echigo Tsumari, and the current one, it being a Triennale, is on right now. The only sad thing about Australia House is, and those of you who read um, uh, John McDonald's review about it last weekend, is that there was an ecstatic reception for the latest uh, display there of Snuff Puppets, which was a collaborative venture built with the Japanese locals in the village, tremendously uh, enthusiastically received, but there's not enough money to keep Australia House going as a um, residence for artists. So whether it will be there for the next Triennale, we don't know. MacDonald pointed out that as it, uh, by comparison with much more glamorous Venice Triennale, it's probably better value for money. And that, I'm afraid, provides the theme for my presentation, which is in much greater length, and I hope will be published by the collectors of these papers, called Cultural Diplomacy's New Clothes. Of course, Australia's been in the game of cultural diplomacy for a very long time. And it's our rivals or our competitors have been at it for very much longer. Some of them spend a lot more than we do on it. The Canadians, for instance, spend more on cultural diplomacy than we do on our entire foreign service. China and the United States do it in a rather different way, which more seems to resemble propaganda than the kind of thing we think of as cultural diplomacy. Some do it for different reasons. Unique language countries are very keen on cultural diplomacy for the obvious reasons. Those with big expat communities do it to keep their expats in touch with the capital. Countries like France, Spain, Japan, Korea, India, Sweden, and even Indonesia and the Philippines come to mind. They are serious about their reasons for cultural diplomacy. They take it seriously, and in their different ways, they put a lot of resources into it. Australia doesn't have those motivations about promoting a unique language, a unique culture. In fact, there are some of the responses we get to our efforts abroad are that there are many people in our region who think that the only unique thing about Australian culture is the indigenous element of it. That's the only thing in many people's view that distinguishes Australia from other Western countries. Furthermore, as a challenge for us, in our neighborhood, there's not, you might say, a high regard for um, Australia as a cultural center, as a place apart from its natural attributes where people would expect to have rewarding cultural experiences um, or being photographed in front of a few icons. Um, so you might add that if that's the case, you might conclude that there's more need for Australia to put a lot of effort into cultural diplomacy uh, as a tool of what Peter Varghese calls persuasion than there is for other countries. And yet, compared to our um, uh, relevant other competitors in the region, we spend a lot less. Comparable countries in, in, just in Indonesia alone, for instance, spend a great deal more than Australia does. And yet, our relationship with Indonesia is one of the most important that we have. 
very often our response to the need for cultural diplomacy has fluctuated. Instead of rising steadily with the years, it goes up and down depending upon individual enthusiasms of ministers or of actual practitioners on the ground or of people in positions of influence in DFAT to devote the, the resources to it. Recent critiques of all this by both the Senate Committee in 2007 and by several papers produced by the Lowy Institute have had some effect, I, I, I must say, and I think that academic interest in the field has grown a lot since that time, and all of this works well to uh, influence the way we perform. And in recent years, the department has caught up with the world trend by changing the name uh, from what used to be called cultural relations to public diplomacy, and still understanding, as my colleagues, former colleagues here have, have said, that there can be both public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy with two different tasks coexisting, and that is what is going on at the moment. And of course, as Peter said this morning, more, uh, a great deal more encouragement is being given to posts to use social media than uh, the rather hesitant response to it in the past. But I'd just like to reflect a little, and my paper does this in more detail, on the background to all of this, because it's important to see how the trend persists. DFAT and its predecessors have always wanted to control um, cultural relations, as they called them. And so when there were other operations going on, Time after time, the department sucked them in. ANIB, for instance, the News and Information Bureau that was wandering around looking for home, was sucked in by DFAT and eventually more or less destroyed, dispersed. Um, Australia Network Television, same thing has happened as a result of government initiative in that particular case. But a significant arm of Australia's cultural diplomacy was lost at that point. The same pattern may perhaps apply to AusAid. Let us wait and see. What, I, I, it's, it's an ominous trend, and one of the most important periods in Australia's cultural diplomacy that very few people know about occurred in the late 60s when Hasluck was foreign minister. Um, and Neil Manton, bless his soul, who wrote the, the definitive account on this and did the uh, research on it, points out that Hasluck drew up a plan for a national overseas cultural policy and for an organization to run it with dedicated staff and with dedicated premises overseas. In other words, Australia houses or replicas of what other countries have, um, many of them, and we do not. And what happened when uh, he wanted was it, uh, this was uh, Hasluck's proposals with the department, drawn up with the department, a specially constituted outside organization which would cooperate with external affairs in arranging student exchanges, lectureships on Australia, art exhibitions, regional conferences, tours of Australia by foreign experts, contacts with organizations in Asian countries, um, founding institutes for Australian culture in other countries, translations of literary and other works on Australia, reciprocal sporting tours, and so on. In your dreams. Anyway, uh, the first year's budget for this was to be £12,500. Instead of that, they set up an IDC. And as somebody earlier said, what governments hate to get is evidence of um, departmental dissension. And they hated it then, and they hate it now, and it and the IDC rode on, and the Australia House movement fell away, and the concentration of funding took place in Australia. Large IDCs continued under different names for many years, and the funding that should have been spent outside Australia was wasted, uh, in my view, inside Australia. And of course, uh, out of that, because we still needed to deal with particular countries that, that where we could see the need for cultural diplomacy, was the, the result was the establishment of the bilateral councils, of which we now have quite a lot, um, and which do a good job within their um, 
capacities and within their resources. And yet at the same time, along with this, you, there's the drumbeat underneath all the time of dissent about the value for money and the accountability for all of this, coming very often from people who don't blench at eye-watering sums spent on military equipment, for instance, or on commemorating past war anniversaries. They never ask how effective this is, but how effective is cultural diplomacy? How can you justify this waste of money? Why is it regarded always as a waste of money? This is politics. There are no votes in it. Just like in the AusAid, which, which actually has a lot of constituency in Australia, but there are no votes in cultural diplomacy because it all happens out there. And I can remember um, uh, Bill Hayden as foreign minister saying to me once when I said that the money spent on bilateral councils in Australia ought to be, more of it ought to get to the post so they could actually do the work. He said, look, mate, he said, where am I going to get patronage from? The foreign minister's got no opportunity for patronage. So they put, he wanted, as, as he was frank enough to admit, that he wanted to put his friends on these councils, and he did, as they all do. And unfortunately, the result at post is thin, and in order to make it a little bit thicker, the department decided to do year of events in various countries, which have been, at their very best, enormously successful. The last one that was done in India, I think, was probably the best we've done. It included a wonderful operation called Bookwalla, where people, Indian and Australian writers, went around together on a train, dragging along, um, pull-along bags made of kangaroo hide with Australian books inside that would open up as displays at literary festivals. And the books would be given away, and they had streams of people lining up for these events and they were so successful that this and another of number of the things that were done in that year of India were designed to be replicated in the following special year of which was going to be Indonesia. Then of course other in events intervened and the year of Indonesia was unceremoniously cancelled. To the detriment of our relations with Indonesia I would add but always Cultural diplomacy, perhaps a bit like aid, falls off the back of a truck when there's a political or an economic downturn in relations, just at the very time when actually it is most needed. The, we now have, as a result of the unfortunate uh, changes with AusAid, a new regime in the department where a lot of people with a lot of new ideas have come in with experience from AusAid, experience of dealing with NGOs and others, and are restaffing and reorganizing what is now the public diplomacy division. So it now has a higher profile in the department rather than the Cinderella role of the past. And there are a lot of new and very good ideas in there, which are detailed in my um, paper and for which I thank people who've been kind enough to share them with me here. For instance, they have some smart things to say, like take the F out of DFAT, less projecting, more connecting. And they're consulting with other countries and experts around the world who all confront these same sorts of problems. How are they modernizing their delivery of um, cultural diplomacy? And and rather than delivering it, how are they making it into partnerships and collaborations rather than sort of handouts, as you might say? So these are really um, uh, encouraging um, developments, as well as that, a lot more emphasis being given to non-government operations. Now, you can always interpret that as being the usual problem because there isn't enough money here. But, and, and of course, Asia Link has done a sterling job over many years in this regard. But I was at the launch the other day in Sydney of the Griffith Review's latest issue on Asian Australian fiction. And it is absolutely splendid. And these are all young writers. They collected 400, and they only printed a handful of those, the very best. And it's absolutely splendid example of what's going on in a kind of an intellect, intellectual, literary, uh, exchange 
between Asian countries and Australia. And um, they modestly said that they, the Griffith Review editors said that they regard this as their contribution to Australian cultural diplomacy, and it is. Very briefly then, Australia takes a different approach to all of this, I would say, than, as I said at the beginning, than, for instance, the United States does. We are more about influence and partnership. The more one reads about what the United States does, and I'm deep in the middle of a stirring book about that at the moment, uh, the more one sees propaganda. I mean, the actual effort is to change minds. And I don't think Australia tries to change minds. In that respect, we have something more like the European approach. But Australia House in Japan should have, could have, replicas all over the world, and it does not. Or does what Peter Varghese said this morning about new technology make all of that kind of delivery method irrelevant? I don't think so. I think we should build on our strength, see what we've done well, do more of it, and realize that while what we do overseas may have no votes for government in Australia, what cultural diplomacy requires is a very special and different mental approach. You have to put yourself not inside the bureaucracy in Canberra, but outside Australia. Look at Australia through the eyes of people there, realize how Australia is seen, and then assess what should be done to make a difference to that. And that is a talent which up to now Australia has been very slow to develop. I look forward to improvements. Thank you.